on World News Tonight. Damn disaster. Heavy rains take its toll on Brazilian infrastructure. Farewell Desmond Tutu. Nobel Prize winner and Archbishop of South Africa passes away. Aviation meltdown. Flights grounded and holiday travellers stranded with the post-Christmas rush. Dazzling Moscow. Just as Christmas ends, Russia gears up for the new year. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with updates on the massive flood hit area. Two dams gave way in the northeastern Brazilian state of Bahia after weeks of heavy rains, swamping already swollen rivers as flooding hit towns across the region. The Igua Dam on the Veruga River near the city of Vitoria de Conquista in southern Bahia collapsed, forcing authorities to evacuate residents mainly in the town of Itambe. A second dam gave way to rising water levels in Giuseppe, 100 kilometers to the north, bringing more alerts for residents to move to safer ground. Rescuers rode dinghies along flooded streets to reach trapped families or take them supplies. One man paddled on an inflatable mattress to reach a home. Bahia Governor Rui Castro said at least 400,000 people have been impacted by the heavy rains and thousands evacuated from some 67 towns, facing emergency situations due to floods caused by heavy rainfall for almost two months. Save the Children said two of their Myanmar staff went missing after the charred remains of more than 30 people were found in an attack a monitoring group and local media blamed on junta troops. These Burmese refugees, freedom and safety lie just a few meters away on the other side of this fence. All are seeking entry into Thailand while fleeing Myanmar's military junta. It's overseen ruthless crackdowns that have left over 1,300 people dead since it retook power in a coup last February. Friday, too, saw it blamed for another attack, one in the country's eastern Kaya state. Over two dozen badly burned bodies were found inside these vehicles, with NGO Save the Children fearing two of its workers are among the victims, something that's pushed it to suspend its activities in Myanmar. We are horrified at the violence carried out against innocent civilians and our staff, who are dedicated humanitarians supporting millions of children in need across Myanmar. Investigations into the nature of the incident are continuing, but attacks against aid workers cannot be tolerated. It's not the first time the NGO has been the victim of Myanmar's ongoing violence. In October, it saw its offices in the town of Thanklang bombed, a single case in over 10 months of violence in which the military has been accused of both torture and extrajudicial executions. The junta says its crackdown is targeting terrorists, pointing to armed opposition groups. All while former leader Aung San Suu Kyi remains under house arrest, facing multiple criminal charges. South Africa's Archbishop Desmond Tutu has died aged 90. Tutu was a key figure in bringing South Africa's apartheid system to an end with his dream of a rainbow nation. His death was announced by South African President Cyril Ramaphosa. Tutu was also a human rights activist and he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984. One of the world's most prominent social rights activists and the man behind South Africa's dream of a rainbow nation. Desmond Tutu could fire up huge crowds while preaching his message of non-violence. He led the fight against apartheid in South Africa with his speeches. When black consciousness movement leader Steve Biko was murdered by police in 1977, Desmond Tutu delivered the funeral sermon. There was a growing desire for revenge, but once again the archbishop called for non-violence. This was his dream of a rainbow nation, a concept that made him famous. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984 for his non-violent struggle against apartheid. Ten years later, when the apartheid regime had fallen, President Nelson Mandela put him in charge of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He spent over two years listening to stories of imprisonment and torture, stories that sometimes drove him to tears. After he survived prostate cancer, Tutu decided to move beyond the borders of South Africa to join the fight for global justice. From the refugee camps of South Sudan to the post-election crisis in Ivory Coast. 
He remained an outspoken and sometimes controversial peace activist throughout his travels. He attacked Israel over the country's treatment of Palestinians, calling it a modern apartheid. But his main target became South African President Jacob Zuma, whom he accused of corruption. In April 2013, he received the Templeton Prize for his work in the realms of love and forgiveness. Can we then put a smile back on God's face? Despite the terrible stories of those who crossed his path, Desmond Tutu's smiles, laughter and dancing showed he had a faith that could put an end to injustice. Protesters opposed to military rule and reached the vicinity of the presidential palace in the capital of Khartoum for the second time in a week, despite heavy tear gas and a communications blackout in Sudan. Tear gas and water cannon against a growing movement angry at military rule. Sudan's capital Khartoum was once again the scene of mass pro-democracy protests. A military coup in October threw the country's transition to democracy into disarray, and the reinstatement of the military and civilian government a month later failed to ease anger at the army's power grab. Almost 50 people have been killed and hundreds injured in crackdowns on anti-coup protests since October. And there have been allegations of security forces raping women protesters. In the lead-up to Saturday's rally, the authorities blocked roads and bridges. Internet and phone lines were cut off. But the pro-democracy movement is still finding ways to stand together against military rule. Thousands of Russian troops have reportedly withdrawn from the Ukraine border after conducting month-long drills, as tensions remain high amid fears that Moscow may be planning an attack. After Russian troops took part in month-long drills in several regions near Ukraine, more than 10,000 soldiers are returning to their permanent bases. That's according to Interfax News Agency on Saturday, citing the Russian military, which described the drills as a stage of combat coordination now completed. Russia's deployment of tens of thousands of troops to the north, east and south of Ukraine had fueled fears in Kiev and the west that Moscow was planning an attack. Some drills took place in Crimea, which Russia annexed in 2014. There have been a flurry of phone calls between Western leaders and Russian President Vladimir Putin in recent months over Russia's military buildup on the Ukrainian border. But Putin has denied any plans for an invasion. He says Russia needs commitment from Western nations, including a promise from NATO not to expand the alliance eastward toward Russian borders because its own security is threatened by Ukraine's growing ties with the Western alliance. Moscow also says it can deploy its troops on its own territory as it sees fit. One U.S. intelligence report suggested there could be up to 175,000 troops that recently moved closer to Ukraine. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Moving on to the updates of the COVID pandemic. U.S. airlines called off hundreds of flights for a third day in a row as crews were grounded amid surging COVID-19 infections due to the highly transmissible Omicron variant, forcing tens of thousands of Christmas travelers to change their plans. Hundreds of flights were canceled across the U.S. for a third day over the Christmas holiday as surging COVID-19 infections grounded flight crews. Commercial airlines canceled more than 700 flights in the U.S. on Sunday, nearly 1,000 on Christmas Day and about 700 on Christmas Eve, according to a tally on flight tracking website flightaware.com. Further cancellations were likely and more than 1,400 flights were delayed. The rapid spread of the Omicron variant has led to a sharp increase in COVID-19 infections during a peak travel time, forcing airlines to cancel flights with pilots and crew needing to be quarantined. Delta Airlines expected more than 300 of its flights to be canceled on Sunday due to the virus and winter weather. FlightAware data showed more than 2,000 flights were called off around the world on Sunday and at least another 7,000 were delayed. Omicron now accounts for nearly three quarters of U.S. COVID-19 cases and as many as 90 percent in some areas like the Northeast. 
New U.S. coronavirus cases have risen 45 percent over the past week, according to a Reuters tally. While recent research suggests Omicron produces milder illness and a lower rate of hospitalizations than previous variants of COVID-19, health officials remain cautious. India is to start administering COVID-19 booster shots as a precautionary measure to healthcare and frontline workers from the 10th of January. Let's cross over to Abhidhar in a World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar from Delhi in India for more. Gayatri? Yes, Anuradi. Prime Minister Narendra Modi made the announcement as cases of the Omicron coronavirus variant rose across the country. In a national address, Modi also said those aged 15 to 18 would start receiving COVID-19 vaccinations from January 3rd and those above 60s with comorbidities would be offered booster shots after a recommendation from the doctors. India has reported a swift rise in Omicron cases with the number reaching 415 overall across 17 Indian states. Modi government has been accelerating its vaccination campaign administering at least one dose to 88% of the eligible 944 million populations while 61% have taken both doses. As millions still await second shots, the authorities will now start offering booster shots to healthcare and frontline workers who suffered from an overwhelming second wave of the virus in summer that killed tens of thousands. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India. COVID infections in France hit six figures this weekend. Health officials recording over 104,000 cases over the previous 24 hours. The third consecutive day, the numbers have been record high. The French government is about to make life more complicated for the unvaccinated and those who have had only two shots of an anti-COVID vaccine. It will push on Monday a bill that will transform the health pass into a vaccination pass by mid-January. Until now, people who have had two shots or once with a negative COVID test could access trains, cultural venues, restaurants and bars. With the new measure, only those who have had their booster would be able to do that. Among other measures the government could push, a new night curfew, at least for New Year's Eve. That's what the Scientific Council advising the government has suggested. Many are questioning whether the country can keep its current isolation rules. People who have a negative test but have been in contact with a person infected with the Omicron variant of COVID have to stay at home for up to 17 days. The government may revise those rules or maintain them, even though they risk crippling the economy. The number of people on sick leave has already jumped by 740 percent between November and December. The South Korean government granted emergency use authorization for Pfizer's COVID-19 pill called Paxlovid. The authorities have enough doses on order already for hundreds of thousands of people, which will be available starting mid-January. South Korea's Ministry of Food and Drug Safety on Monday granted emergency use for Pfizer's COVID-19 pill Paxlovid, making it the first oral antiviral treatment to be used in the country. The approval of Merck's Molnupiravir COVID-19 pill, which is also under review, has been delayed. Paxlovid is set to be used as early as mid-January and will be prescribed to patients recovering at home and those with mild to moderate symptoms. The pill itself can be kept at room temperature and can be taken within 12 months from the date of production. While Paxlovid was found to reduce severe illness and death by up to 88 percent, the experimental drug of Merck showed an efficacy rate of around 30 percent, prompting governments around the world to rush for the Pfizer pill as their first choice. Seoul has secured 604,000 courses of COVID-19 pills, some 360,000 from Pfizer and around 240,000 from Merck. It plans to order an extra 400,000 more early next year. The U.S. has already purchased 10 million Pfizer treatment courses, in Japan 2 million. Lab experiments show that Paxlovid can even be effective in treating the Omicron variant, giving hope that it could be a game-changer in curbing the spread of the virus. Christmas celebrations took place all around the world, but many look different than originally hoped. Different countries were marking the event as COVID creates hurdles for a second holiday season. 
So many across the world are celebrating Christmas just a little differently. Donning masks, filling pews like normal, but this year in smaller numbers. In the UK, the Queen giving her annual Christmas message, her first since losing her husband, Prince Philip. Christmas can be hard for those who have lost loved ones. This year especially, I understand why. Like so many of us, the Queen also changed her plans, spending the day with Prince Charles and Camilla at Windsor Castle. And the biblical city of Bethlehem, keeping the Christmas spirit alive, even without tours for the second year in a row. In Italy, as the country breaks yet another daily record, the Pope speaking today from the central balcony of St. Peter's Basilica with thousands, but far less than usual, of faithful in an adjacent square. He spoke about the importance of staying connected during the pandemic. Italy has canceled all New Year's celebrations, and as Omicron cases spike, new restrictions are coming in across Europe, shuttering bars and restaurants, limits on social gatherings, and the Netherlands even in a full lockdown. Back home in the U.S., the president and first lady meeting virtually with American service members stationed around the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a poor substitute for what... You're missing it. We're grateful for your courage, your sacrifice. And sacrifice is what so many are feeling tonight. As the carol says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. I wish you all a very happy Christmas. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Heavy snow continued to pummel northern and western Japan a day after more than 100 domestic flights in Japan were grounded due to bad weather. At least six people killed as suicide bombers striked restaurants in Berry City near DRC's eastern border with Uganda. Officials blame the Allied Democratic Forces, the central African arm of ISIS, for the attack. The almost $10 billion James Webb telescope has left Earth on its mission to show the first stars to light up the universe. Its flight to orbit lasted just under half an hour, with a signal confirming a successful outcome picked up by a ground antenna at Malindi in Kenya. Britain reported another day of record COVID-19 cases, with new estimates showing swaths of London's populations are carrying the virus, underlining the relentless advance of the Omicron variant. China's local COVID-19 case count recorded the highest number of daily cases since March 2020, driven by a rise in cases in the lockdown northwestern city of Xi'an. Vice President Kamala Harris says that the U.S. is ready to impose pushing sanctions if Russia invades. Despite the large Russian military buildup at the border, the U.S. does not yet think that Putin has made a decision about invading Ukraine. And finally tonight, the center of Moscow dazzled with thousands of lights as the city prepared to welcome the new year and celebrate Orthodox Christmas. More than 4,000 light installations were used to decorate Moscow for the new year, the mayor of the capital, Sergei Sobyanin, wrote in his blog. The center of Moscow was covered with tunnels of Christmas lights, garlands and new year trees created by prominent Russian designers. In Russia, Christmas is celebrated exactly 13 days after Western Christmas because at the beginning of the 20th century, the Russian Orthodox Church decided to observe the Julian calendar, which lags almost two weeks behind the new Gregorian calendar of most other Christians. Last year, the celebrations were partially cancelled due to COVID-19 restrictions. This year, the traditional winter festival, Journey to Christmas, returned to Moscow in 27 locations, including the Red Square. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.